Great. Cool. Great. Grab a seat, guys. We're going to make a start. Um, it's really great to be joined by Helen Thorne today. Helen, thanks for joining us. From where would you normally be on a Sunday? I would normally be at Dundonald Church uh, in southwest London at the nine o'clock service. So the irony is, having travelled halfway across Britain to be here, I actually had a lie-in this morning compared wow. with my normal <laughs> Sunday. We're glad to have provided you with a lie-in this morning, Helen. Um, Helen, you work for something called Biblical Counselling UK. That sounds very fancy. Can you tell us a bit? What, what is it? What do you do? What does that look like? Biblical Counselling UK uh, actually grew out of a, a church uh, just the other side of, of Cambridge. And um, uh, in conjunction with a, a lot of things that were going on in America. And basically, it's a, an organisation that helps churches connect the riches of scripture to the realities of life. So it assumes that life is hard. Uh, and it also assumes that God has something deep and profound and wonderful to say about that hardship. Uh, and it helps churches and individuals wrestle uh, with making that connection. I, I don't know about you, maybe I'm the only person that struggles in this way, but occasionally I go to church and I hear a fantastic faithful sermon on the sovereignty of God. And I sing wonderful hymns about how God is king. Uh, and I, and I memorise a verse or I read a book about how everything is under control. And I go, praise the Lord, God is king, he is sovereign, he is good. And then I go home and I do a completely headless chicken routine because I honestly believe that everything out is out of control and I will never be able to uh, do anything right. And, and we sometimes have that gap in our faith. And I guess biblical counselling uh, exists to kind of shrink that gap. Uh, and some of us will be kind of doing that in very informal coffee table kind of ways. Uh, and some of us will end up doing those in very formal kind of ways with people that are struggling uh, very profoundly. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen, for explaining that. I feel like I understand a bit better what biblical counselling is. Um, I know you're, you've spoken to quite a few students before, haven't you, in the past, and you yourself were a student once upon a time. Tell us a bit about Helen as a student. If we'd have met Helen as a student, what would, what would, what would we have seen? What, would you, what were you like as a student? Well, Helen as a student certainly wouldn't be coming to a student lunch at a nice church uh, anywhere, um, not in the first couple of years anyway. Helen, as a student, was pretty out of control. Uh, I'd had, in many ways, a, a fairly normal uh, childhood, but a, a very painful childhood. Um, there'd be a lot of uh, bereavement within the family. There'd been a lot of kind of abuse from outside of the family. And um, that meant I was reeling quite a lot by the time I went to university. And I don't really think I did many lectures. I, I was largely in the bar, drinking heavily, uh, struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety... Uh, and by halfway through, through the second year uh, was a fully-fledged addict who was very much struggling with life. And I know um, there were people who came alongside you, friends at, at uni, who were a real help to you. What, do you want to tell us a bit more about that? What, um, yeah, how, did, how did things change for you while you were a student? So there were probably three categories of people that got alongside me. There were my friends at uni that just said, Helen, we love you, but you're out of control. Something has got to, to change. Uh, they, they weren't particularly people of faith, but they were people that loved me, uh, and they encouraged me to go and chat to one of my lecturers. I was doing a biochemistry degree. I can't remember a thing about biochemistry now, but at the time, I was very excited about biochemistry. Uh, and uh, bless him, uh, he, did, uh, an he rewrote an entire lecture uh, uh, on the dangers of addiction and what it does to your liver and your kidneys and, and your brain. Uh, and there I was sat in this lecture uh, with all this information basically coming at me uh, in, in not too pointed, but a slightly pointed way. Uh, and afterwards, he put me in touch with a rehab program um, again, not a Christian rehab program, but uh, one which was full of very wise people uh, that would love me well. And a Christian couple, uh, who were the kind of the third category of people, uh, offered to sponsor me through that. Um, and I was horrible to them. I mean, I was a brat. It was disgraceful. I mean, I used to storm out of their house. I told them I hated them. I told them that uh, their God was made up or he was ridiculous. Uh, uh, and they just kept loving me. And they kept welcoming me back. And they kept saying that God loved me too. So one Christmas, uh, a little while uh, later on, uh, they invited me round for mince pies and midnight communion at the local Anglican church. I think out of a combination of guilt um, at how I'd behaved, intrigue at this God that apparently loved me, even though I was horrible, and a deep love of mince pies... Um, I think those three things kind of drew me along to, to the Christmas carol service that, that Christmas. 
And I was just captivated. I didn't become a Christian there then, but I, I was absolutely captivated by the thought of a God who would leave the glories of heaven to come down to earth, not just to live, but to die for people that were in as much of a mess as I was and to bring me into a relationship with him. Uh, so that was the start of a, about a seven-month journey uh, of me asking the most awkward questions uh, that I could think of uh, to try and prove that Christianity wasn't true. Um, but unsurprisingly, I failed. Uh, and about seven months later, I was gripped by grace. And uh, that's about 33 years ago now, and no regrets. That's really cool, Helen. Thanks for, thanks for being willing to share personally from your own experience. I'll hand over to you now, I'm sure, because you've got lots of things to, to share with us. Thanks, Helen. Well, it is an absolute joy and pleasure uh, to be with you here today. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity to have uh, lunch together every Sunday. What a blessing that is. Well, the reality is that life was not meant to be this way. If we rewind time to the beginning of Genesis 1, we will find the perfect world. A world where there was no pain, no anxiety, no depression, no psychosis, none of the stresses and strains that we all know so well now. We were designed to have a perfect relationship with the God who made us, a perfect relationship with the people around us, a perfect relationship with the world in which we were living. It was glorious. I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like, getting up every morning knowing that the day ahead was going to be a joy? Getting up every morning knowing that no one was going to say anything hurtful to us and nothing stupid was going to come out of your mouth. A day of knowing that work was going to be a delight, not a hardship. Of course, there will come a point when life is like that again. For those who are in Christ, Revelation 21 and 22 reminds us that the new heavens and the new earth are a place of beauty, of perfection. No more darkness, no more pain, no more tears, no more death. It's going to be good again one day. But the reality is, you and I, right now, we don't live in those bookends of history. We don't live in the perfection of Eden. We don't live in the perfection of the new heavens and the new earth. We live now in the broken world, in the world that has been broken ever since Genesis 3, in the world that's been broken ever since relationship with God got severed, relationship with each other got marred by power plays and discord, and the relationship with the world around us became hard. Work, studies, friendships, families, all got broken. Decay entered the world. Our bodies got broken. From then on in, none of our biochemistry, none of our bodies worked as they should be. We were designed for a world where we could thrive. But now, well, some of it's good. We still have little glimpses of the wonder of God's creation. As we look around at each other, we can still see that we are in the image of God. There is beauty and loveliness and creativity and gifting in, in all the people we see. But it hurts, doesn't it? It's hard. We don't get up every morning thinking everything is going to be okay. We don't have relationships that are universally safe and affirming. We do say things and do things that hurt others. Our bodies just don't work as they were designed to. Not perfectly, at least. Of course, even in this broken world, there is such a thing as thriving. Uh, some people can have good mental health. Uh, and mental health is designed like this. Or defined like this, if we can nip on. Thank you. Mental health is not just the absence of mental disorder. It's defined as a state of well-being in which every individual uh, realises his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. That's what the world around us defines mental health as. I, I think as Christians, we might want to tweak little bits of that. It's not just realising our potential. It's about living life in the fullness that that course that you're going to be doing later in the term uh, was speaking of. It's about living life in Christ uh, to his glory, not just about our potential. But, but there is something beautiful there, isn't there? Something wonderful about living a life where we thrive. The trouble is, 
many of us will know that our mental health isn't universally good. There's a whole host of mental illnesses uh, that we might struggle with. I'm not going to read them all out. Uh, That's just some of the major categories. There are a huge number of ways in which the human body and the human mind can struggle. For most of us, the rubber hits the road with depression or anxiety or stress. Maybe our relationship with food, things like that. But there are a whole host of ways things can go horribly wrong. Well, if any of that sounds familiar, if any of that sounds where you're at or where some of your friends are at, then please know that you are not alone. The statistics remind us that there are a huge number of people struggling each and every day. One in six of us will be struggling uh, in any given week. About one in five adults consider taking their own life. 8% will struggle with anxiety and depression. 6% as a general rule will struggle with anxiety. But at the height of lockdown, it seems a little while ago now, doesn't it? But at the height of lockdown, 66% of us were saying that we had felt anxious in the previous two weeks. That is how astronomically high anxiety levels have been over the last couple of years. It shouldn't surprise us that people struggle. We live in this fallen world, this broken world since Genesis 3. Life has been hard. Pandemics are hard. Finals are hard. Everything is is hard in some way. And so there's going to be a reaction in our bodies. To struggle is normal. And to struggle as Christians is normal too. Sometimes that sticks in the throat slightly, doesn't it? Sometimes we have a view of our faith which is a bit more, well, shouldn't we just trust? Shouldn't we just be okay? Shouldn't we have that deep, deep joy in our heart because we know Christ? Shouldn't our faith in him make it all possible to be fine? Well, I can't find anywhere in the Bible any assurance that in this life, Christians are going to be free from stresses and strains, from mental illness, from the battles of mental health. I can find lots of examples of people like Elijah who lay face down and said, I want to die. I can find lots of examples of people like David who were hiding in a cave, expressing their fears. I can find lots of examples of people who had to lament Jeremiah, Jesus, Job, because life was at times so very hard. Our faith does make a difference in times of stress. Our faith makes a huge difference when our mental health has taken a knock. But our faith doesn't inoculate us. It's not some kind of spiritual bubble wrap that protects us from life being difficult. And so as Christians, we should be expecting to struggle too. Well, we've got about 20, 22 minutes uh, to look at this topic. And I'm going to make a few assumptions as we do so. Uh, Assumption number one is that sometimes it's hard to talk about these things. So please note that I'm not going to ask anyone to be sharing something deeply personal, either with me or out loud or on your tables. Although I do hope that this church is a church where that is encouraged in relationships where you know each other well. And I'm getting some nods from the staff, so that's a a very good sign. Please do be sharing your lives. I'm going to make the assumption that we all know what it's like to struggle with our mental health at times. Even if it's not something that we struggle with a lot personally, we'll have glimpsed it and we'll know people that do. I'm going to work on the assumption that actually we want to talk about this biblically, wisely, and well. But I'm also going to work on the assumptions that I'm going to be talking to you as Christians, not as therapists. I'm not going to assume that we're a bunch of psychiatrists or psychologists here. I'm not going to be using lots of technical terminology, although I know some of you will be very familiar with those technical terms. What we're going to be looking at is from a biblical perspective, how we can be Christians together, brothers and sisters encouraging one another, when times are hard. Well, let's make a start. What are the roots of mental health struggles? Well, to find the answer to that question, it's useful to look in three different directions. There's, I suppose, what some of the secular world might call the more sociological model. There is the fact that we live in a broken, fallen world where hard things happen to us. There is abuse. There's bullying. There's relationship breakdown. There's discord. 
There, there are, there's grief, there's bereavement, there are so many hard things. There's pressures of our time. They all crash in and they make a difference to us. We are only human. We cannot live in a world where there is pressure after pressure and for it not to impact us in any way. The first root uh, of mental struggles or mental illness or, or, or mental lack of well-being is the hard stuff that comes at us. And if I were to talk to each and every one of you, I know you'd be able to articulate some things in the past, some things in the present that have been hard. So things in the future that you are genuinely worried about. The second route uh, to look at is what's happening in us. God has made us embodied souls. In other words, we've got a fleshly bit on the outside, a heart on the inside. Our heart is a place maybe where we think and feel and desire and choose, but our bodies, that's the place where the biochemistry goes on. And actually, part of the roots of a lot of mental illness or men, uh, well-being struggles is that our bodies are not functioning as they should. Our neurotransmitters, our hormones, they may not be working as they were designed to work. We might be on medication that's got side effects. We might have a physical ailment which actually produces a bit more anxiety uh, than we would normally have. Our bodies matter, and God knows they matter because he made them that way. Of course, the third and possibly the, the slightly less popular one to talk about is the decisions coming out of us. Was it John Calvin that described our hearts as idol factories? We're always going after things that are either not good for us or, or maybe are good for us, but not in that proportion. It's the kind of thing that is, it's good to work hard, but actually if I'm going to work so hard that I completely ignore God's call and command for a, a Sabbath, a, a day of rest, well then I shouldn't be surprised if I get burnt out because I'm not designed to work seven days a week, uh, 20 hours a day. It's just not going to work that way. It, it might be that I, I, I want to be married or uh, to, to be in a relationship, uh, and that's not wrong. But actually, if I want that so much that I believe that God is giving me a second best kind of life and I get really discontent because I haven't got what I think I want, well, that's something that's coming out of us, not that's coming at us or happening in us. And when we look at the tough stuff coming at us, the biochemistry going on in us, the idolatry, the desires coming out of us, then that tends to be fertile ground for struggles to take place. We know that on those days when we can remember the bullying of the past, when our hormones are not working as they should and we're crying for we can't remember quite why, when we're telling God that he ought to be giving us something that he's not and get angry with him and not wanting to live life his way, that's when stress and depression and anxiety can flourish the most. Now, if you're struggling with anxiety or depression, please know that those things can happen in so many different proportions and combinations. For some of us, it's much more of a medical, biochemical thing. For others of us, it's much more about a painful past. For, for some of us, it's a combination of all those three. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. But they're the kind of areas to explore when life is hard. The places where we find the explanation of what life is like. And it hurts. The experience of that is so desperately painful. The experience of that impacts our body, our mind, our, our relationships, even our spiritual lives. That there is a sense in which, you know, just be thinking about this for a moment in quietness of your heart. If you're struggling with your mental health, maybe your palms are getting sweaty, maybe your, your shoulders are getting tight, maybe your sleep is disrupted, maybe you have that glorious gastrointestinal joy that comes with anxiety when it's at its height. I'm not alone, there were a lot of smiles just then. Our body reacts when our mind is struggling. We can feel overwhelmed. There are emotional responses too. We might cry, we might feel like the world is crashing in. We might get nervous, want to withdraw for, for, for no reason that we can actually articulate. It feels like our mind is about to explode. And it impacts everything that's happening in our relationships around. There are moments when we just want to run to other people, go, help me, please make it better. I need to spend time with you, please help. And others, when we just push them away, just leave me alone. 
I just want to stay in my room. I want to stay in my bed. Just, just let me hide. I don't want to come to church. I, I don't want to come to a party. I don't want to go to lectures. I just want to be. There are moments when it comes out as anger too. Do you live in shared accommodation? Do you know that most of the time when someone leaves a cup somewhere on the floor, that's all right. You either just leave it there or you pick it up. It's no big deal. It's a cup. But when your mental health is struggling, when stress and anxiety and depression are in full flow, that cup is an act of war. Do they not know how hard my life is already? Do they not care about me at all? Do I have to do everything in this house? I'm the only person that ever does any work. And so it mushrooms out of control. And then there's our spiritual life too. I mean, church is great. Teaching's wonderful. The lunch is good. But when we're depressed, there's a lot of people here. It's quite loud. Maybe it'd be easier to stay home. Maybe, maybe if I stayed home, then actually no one would ask me if how I am. And then if no one asked me how I am, then I don't either have to tell them how I am or lie. Maybe it would be better if I could just run away from church. Maybe if I didn't come to the focus group, no one would notice. And then there's God. Does he really care about me? This saving God, this sustaining God, where, where is he when life feels so desperately hard? Feeling like that feels horrible. Feeling like that is one of the worst feelings a human can have. And so we try and escape, don't we? We go on and we, we, we look at different ways of making it better. We eat just a little bit more or, or just a little bit less to bring a sense of comfort or control. We don't just do a normal amount of exercise. We either stay in bed or we run and we run and we run and we run until all the anxiety has been replaced by utter exhaustion. Maybe we turn to alcohol, as I did, or drugs. Maybe it's the numbing effect of just scrolling through Instagram reels, picture after picture after picture of Alsatian puppy catching a ball. It's not that it's doing us any good, but it numbs us so we don't feel a thing. Or getting lost in a game, not that there's anything wrong with gaming per se, but actually getting so lost in another world that it blocks out the real world just for a while. Maybe becoming a bit more controlling of people. Or the good old evangelical problem of saying, I'm fine, thank you, praise the Lord, God is good. And underneath, be breaking into a thousand pieces. Well, there are better ways. And there is hope of where to go next. And there is common wisdom in the world. There are ways we can just breathe more helpfully when we're under stress. Uh, the more stress we get, the, the higher our breathing tends to become. By breathing deeply from down here, we can physiologically bring calm to our bodies. It's a cliche, but it works. In through the nose, out through the mouth, nice and slowly. God has wired us that way. We can do a whole host of grounding techniques. The most simple, just quietly touching our finger against our thumb, little by little. The body responds to touch much more quickly than it responds to sound. That's why a hug is so important when we're going through a tough time. But there's not always a person you can hug when you're shopping in Primark. And so touching your fingers against the thumb can be a useful way of stimulating those receptors in your body and bringing you back to the present. If you Google, you will find a whole host of grounding techniques. Some of them are delightful. I did a fear of flying course once because I'm not great on planes, and they did this grounding technique. They said, once you're on a plane, on takeoff, get your hands at the top of your head and start doing this repeatedly. <laughs> I've never been brave enough to try that on takeoff. <laughs> but if you'd like to try that, feel free. I think it does just stimulate you in ways that you would not normally uh, be stimulated physically. Healthy eating and exercise, it, it's simple, but it makes such a difference. If we're getting our vegetables and our protein in, our body is going to work better. Actually, getting out for a walk is a wonderful thing. One of the best things as students you can do is find that member of the congregation that's a little bit older than you that has a Labrador that needs walking. Get them out. Great. The minister. Walk the dog. Exercise. Fresh air. 
unconditional love from something that just can't stop hugging you with its tongue. <laughs> Rest. I know that's easier said than done when you've got finals coming up and exams, but actually getting some sleep does make a difference. Reprioritizing. I'm going to let you into a little life hack that's got me through the last 10 years. Nothing bad happens if you don't iron your clothes once you start working. I know that's not a big deal once you're a student. But once you start working, often that, that pressure isn't there to look smart and smart and smarter. Nothing bad happens. I literally don't own an iron. And I haven't for a decade. It's great. Find that thing that you don't need to do and cut it out of your life. See your GP. There's nothing wrong with taking medication when life hurts. But what about God's word? What do we find there that can help us? God has built us into a community. These people that you're sitting next to right now are not just random human beings. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're going to be spending eternity with them. And, and God has put you together, designed you to live together, to be together, to share lives together. Because that is the context in which you persevere and change. It's not that this is a therapeutic community. We are going to need our doctors and our, our medics, our psychiatrists and our psychologists probably outside. But this is the community for love. This is the community for perseverance. This is the community for hope. This is the community for relationship. We are designed to be known. Not for everyone to know absolutely everything about us, that would be weird and inappropriate, but where we can share lives deeply, where when we're having a struggle, somebody else actually knows. The, the image of, a, of the church is that, that of a body. And when one bit of the body hurts, the other bit of the body should be aware of that. It's like me when I'm gardening. I am the most inept gardener on the face of the planet. But I've recently inherited a 100-foot jungle, and it needs to be tamed. <clears throat> so I'm out there. I'm out there with axes. I'm out there with hammers. I'm out there with sickles and scythes and a mattock, which is the most wonderful gardening tool ever created. It's a bit like a pickaxe and a sledgehammer in one. It is glorious. You're getting a little too much insight into my psyche here. I'm going to stop talking now. But as a result, I, I bruise myself. I, I, I cut myself. I, I, I hurt myself as I'm out there hacking through the undergrowth. And it's not just my thumb that notices. It may only be my thumb that has the bruise, but the rest of me knows. And it's like that in the church. When we're struggling with anxiety, when we're struggling with depression, there's meant to be an awareness of the people around us so we can love each other well. We're meant to be a community where, <clears throat> Hebrews 10 reminds us, we spur each other on to love and good works. We're meant to be a community where we say to each other, come on. I, you haven't slept in 48 hours now. Let's, let's just turn the light off and let's chill for a moment. A community where we're praying for each other to support each other through. A community where, as Ephesians 4 reminds us, we speak the truth in love to one another by encouraging and comforting and challenging and doing all those things that family is supposed to do. And as we do that, we're designed to be a community that spots the lies that mental illness and, and, and poor well-being tells us and actually speaks truth to one another in help, ways that help us to flourish. I struggle with anxiety myself, not as much as I did, uh, but it's still there. And, and there are five things that I think about time and time again when I'm anxious. But they're all lies. I'm all alone. I can't keep going. It's all out of control. This is all my fault. I can never change. That's the kind of thing that gets stuck on a loop in my brain, like a, a, one of those old records where the, the needle gets stuck and it just won't stop. And if you struggle with anxiety or depression or any other host of struggles that we can face in this world, they're the kind of thoughts that are going to be going around your mind or your friends' minds too. But they are lies. They are such hideous, horrible lies. We are not alone. Psalm 139 reminds us that you can't go from the heights or the depths or the east or the west to be away from God. He is there. For those of us who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is living inside us. He is more intimate than it is possible for anyone else to be. God doesn't sleep. He knows us. He sees us. He's with us. 
But it's not just so, some kind of cosmic surveillance system that's out there going, oh, those people, gosh, there's Alistair. Yes, I see what he's doing now. Folded arms, interesting. How, how fascinating what he's up to right now. He's a God who is active as he is with us. He's a God who's at work in us. A God who is providing for us. I love the story of the Exodus. Uh, the, the, people who, uh, of, uh, the people who left Egypt uh, after slavery, they're just so normal uh, and fallible, just like me. And they'd seen the plagues. They'd seen the Passover. They'd seen the parting of a sea. They'd seen an entire Egyptian army wiped out. They'd seen God leading them into the future. And within two and a half months of going, can we go back? I, it, it just, I just felt like going back would be better. I don't really want to go forward into the future. It's a bit unknown and scary, and I don't have all the kind of food and water that I was hoping for. Can we just go back to Egypt? Yeah, I know they were killing our children. Yeah, that was a problem, but they had cucumbers. Do you remember the cucumbers? So gloriously human. God could have got grumpy. But what he does is he provides for them. Manna and quail on a Monday. Manna and quail on a Tuesday. Manna and quail on a Wednesday. He gives them what they need. He doesn't give them what they need for 10 years' time, but he gives them what they need for then. He provides. Do you ever feel like life is out of control? Do you ever sit there going, I can't, I can't, I just, I don't get what's going on. The Bible doesn't tell us that Joseph in the Old Testament struggled from anxiety, so I don't want to push the Bible beyond what it says. But the story of Joseph went like this, hated by his brothers, almost murdered, thrown down a well, sold into slavery, trafficked into a foreign land, uh, sold as a slave into a household where the woman uh, was not a moral person, uh, convicted of a crime he didn't commit, thrown into jail uh, without, um, it, when he didn't deserve it, was forgotten by his friends, only got out of jail when asked to stand before the most powerful person in the nation and do an impossible task, uh, with God's help managed to do that impossible task, and then was given a decade-long uh, famine management program to oversee. I'm going to go out on a limb there and say he had a bad day at some point in that, where he struggled. But do you know, remember what he said at the end of that? when he met his brothers again. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. However bad, however painful, however mysterious, however wrong our life sometimes is, and it's important to say sometimes our life is wrong and hard, the purposes of God are above them, and he is knitting something beautiful together. Or what about it's all my fault? We do get things wrong sometimes, but sometimes we blame ourselves for things that are not our fault. Sometimes we take on guilt unnecessarily. But even when it is our fault, there's forgiveness, there's grace. We have a God who loves to clean us up. We have a God who lavishes grace on his children. If you've turned to Christ, you are clean. You're not guilty. There's no condemnation. You're washed whiter than snow, Psalm 51 says. And as for I can never change... <clears throat> Philippians 1.6 promises us that the God who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion. Sometimes when we're struggling with our mental health, with our anxiety, our stress, our depression, I think we get the impression that God looks down from heaven to us and goes, oh, what a mess. I don't know what this area of Cambridge is like, but I'm guessing there are some houses somewhere where you walk past and go, <clears throat> what a mess. You know, the ones where the the roof is a bit broken and the, the curtains are falling down and the garden's a bit overgrown and the wall's a bit listing and the paint's peeling off of the front door. What a mess. But you see, just like you can get those television renovation programs where they can take a mess and make it beautiful, God is in the restoration business of his children. He, he, he look at our lives and go, if I can build their trust there, if I can help them see my goodness there, if I can help them see how I have made them to be there, if I can help them persevere, if I can surround them by people that love them, if I can get them to really get what sovereignty and that means, oh, they're going to be even more beautiful than they are right now. It's like God doesn't look down on heaven and go, oh, what a mess. He looks down on us and goes, ah, oh, St. Andrew, the great students. What a bunch of fixer-uppers. 
they're going to be wonderful when I finish my work in them. And so what we can do as this talk comes to an end is that in whatever the circumstances of our life, notwithstanding that sometimes medical help is going to be needed, we can as a community be people that help each other change. We can be people who help each other uh, go forward into the future, doing things a little bit differently to now. If we can just nip onto the next slide, that'd be great. Ephesians 4 reminds us that every Christian is designed to change, and every Christian can change because the Spirit is at work. We're designed to take off our old self, have our mind renewed, and put on our new self. That's not about taking off depression, thinking happy thoughts and bouncing into the future like a bunny. That would be trite and inappropriate and, and not helpful at all. But it, but it is about just catching little ways we're thinking and behaving and together replacing those with things that are more wholesome and wise. For example, how about thinking, oh, God hates me. He must hate me. Look at my life. Look at how much I'm messing up. He can't possibly love someone like me. I fail him all the time. That's an old self-belief. That's the sort of belief that is not what we're called to as Christians. That's, that's a lingering from our past and all the painful things that's happened. And, and, and the Bible says, let's catch those, either individually or, or preferably together. Let's catch ourselves when we think that God hates us and go, no, 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 that's an old self. That's something I want to take off. Lord, please help me to stop believing that you hate me. And then we can look in God's word. And if you need help finding things in God's word, there are staff here, there are focus group members here, there are lovely mature Christians here that can help you do that. And we can look at all the different ways that God loves us and has lavished good things into our life. And we can pray and we can turn and go, Lord, please help me to believe that I am loved by you because that is what your word says. Does that take away the biochemistry of depression? No, it doesn't. Does that take away the biochemistry of anxiety? No. But does it give us hope, perspective, somewhere to go, truth to hang on to? It does. I remember when I was a student uh, in those really early, rocky uh, post-addiction days. As I was facing my finals and unpicking what it meant to follow Jesus in the middle of the mess that was going on inside me and quite frankly the mess in my studies having drunk my way through two, two years plus of my degree course. I remember thinking, God can't love me. He must still see me as a mess. My life is, can't be in his hands. That just doesn't make sense. And I put three words on my phone it was an old brick of a phone back then, but a phone nevertheless. Loved, secure, forgiven. And I remember the first few weeks going, love, secure, forgiven, yeah, whatever. And then the next couple of weeks going, love, secure, forgiven. Well, that would be nice. And then the next few months going, love, secure, forgiven. Well, that is what the Bible says, and the Bible does seem to have a track record of being right. It certainly has a better track record of being right than I do. Love, secure, forgiven. Could that really be me? It took a while. But loved, secure, forgiven. That is who I am. That is who you are. And as we begin to grasp these things, more and more we have security and hope in a broken world. No perfection this side of heaven. No over-realized eschatologies in St. Andrew the Great on Sunday afternoon in May. One day we'll be perfect. Now it's messy, but it can be good and safe and hope-filled in the mess. I'm going to have a Q&A in a minute, but just a couple of resources uh, to, to be thinking about. For those of you that are more medically minded and would be looking for something to help you have a biblical focus on uh, medication and diagnoses, uh, a lovely doctor in America who's also a pastor, uh, Mike Emlett has written a book called Descriptions and Prescriptions. It's very short uh, and very worth a read. For those of you uh, who want to do some one-to-ones uh, where you want to tackle some of the hard things of life, real change is a course that can be done in local churches. And I'm going to do an unashamed plug, Hope in an Anxious World, a book 
for those of us who are Christians struggling with anxiety, but written as a giveaway book to our friends who don't yet know Jesus, but would like to hear a little more of what he says about what the Bible says about our anxious world. I should stop talking. In fact, I should have stopped talking five minutes ago. Do you want to tell us uh, what's going to happen next? Thanks so much, Helen. And um, we'll take a minute now, just round table, so let's um, share anything that struck us. But let's also post questions or vote for questions. Pigeonhole, maybe we can get the pigeonhole slide back up. Thanks, Johnny. Um, I think the passcode is lunch. Um, yeah, let's take a minute, round tables. Um, do pass plates to the back as well, if you haven't already done so. And then I'll we'll call us back together in a second. We'll, we'll take some questions for Helen. Great. Thanks for all the questions, guys. We're going to make a start. If you need to head off in a sec, please feel very free to head out the side door. I think we will run on a little bit. We'll probably go to about 20 past, 25 past, but feel free to head off if you need to now um, or in a few minutes. That's fine to slip out. Um, Helen, we've got lots and lots of great questions here, and some we've just been saying some really tricky questions that would definitely take longer than a few minutes to talk about. So Helen can only give highlight answers. <laughs> please feel free to come and grab her afterwards. She's going to stick around Let's talk to each other. Let's keep chatting about these things. But good to, good to get the ball rolling with some of these things. Um, are we able to pop up some of the questions, Johnny, as I do them? the first question? Um, how do you deal with the fact that so much CBT therapy advice seems to be about becoming more self-centered? Thank you. Uh, and the relationship between Christians and secular therapies mm. is a, a tricky and a complex one. Mm. I think the first thing I'd want to say is that there's lots of really good stuff about CBT. Uh, that sense of um, the way we think impacting the way we behave, uh, and actually by changing the way we think, we can change the way we behave. That kind of basic building block of CBT is sound and good and entirely in tune with what the Bible says. Uh, and there are lots of really gentle and careful and, and wise CBT practitioners out there. So no psychology uh, not bashing uh, from, from the front. I just want to kind of put that little caveat in there. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There are moments where we're encouraged to kind of just keep on loving ourselves and fulfilling our own potential and doing what we desire um, rather than uh, actually pursuing Christ, which a secular professional is never going to encourage us to do. However, what a sec good secular professional will do is take our faith into consideration when they're treating us. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's entirely appropriate for us, in a, if we're having CBT, uh, to say to somebody, actually, that conflicts with my faith a little bit. Can I just tease out uh, you know, what's going on there, what your thinking is there, and, and how that could be changed so it's more in line with what I believe? And I think when we're having any kind of therapy, um, or if we're training to give kind of therapy, actually having those conversations is a good thing to do. Uh, in the past, I've had secular therapy, and I, I've said to my therapist, hang on, I don't really think I can do that because I, I have some theological qualms about that. And they've always just stopped and went, oh, Helen, tell me more about that, and we've worked it through. So I think have a voice uh, and find a way of um, actually taking what's good in CBT but moulding it in a way that you're comfortable with uh, to sit with your faith. Um, uh, but, but, yeah, I think if you're not comfortable doing something, don't do it. Great. And just to follow up, someone's just put in a question about um, secular therapy. Are you saying Christians can see secular therapists? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Great. like everything with the world, have your brain engaged in terms of your theology and, and things like that. But, uh, yes, it's absolutely fine. I, I think there are some secular therapies that mesh with our faith a little bit more easily than others. Uh, CBT doesn't tend to crunch too often. I mean, it does crunch a bit, as we've already highlighted. Uh, there are things like mindfulness. You know, there are good things about mindfulness, encouraging us to sit and quiet and be aware of our emotions and to be in the present, not letting our minds spiral into the future. That's a good thing. Um, actually, just emptying our minds rather than taking every thought captive, that's possibly something where there is more of a crunch with our Christian faith. And so go into those things, take what is good, leave what is not, uh, and um, see, where that, see where that leads you, I think. And if people aren't aware of what kind of therapists are around, please do come and grab myself or Robbie or others. We, we can definitely signpost you to, to people who we can recommend. Um, great. Um, we've got quite a few questions. These are the next most popular questions about the relationship between the kind of spiritual realm and mental health. So there's a question about demon possession. Um, so it says, lots of demon possessions in the Bible seem like mental illnesses. Would you say that harsh mental illnesses are possessions? And there's also a question, um, oh, 
lots of Christians talk as if mental health is unrelated to spiritual reality. What, what do you want to say to those things, Helen? The Bible is clear that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, and in churches and as individuals, we either tend to talk way too much about the devil or way too little. Uh, very rarely <clears throat> do we get it just right. It's a bit like Goldilocks, isn't it? We're either too warm or we're too cold, but we don't actually get it just right. And there are plenty of churches in, in Britain which basically see a demon behind everything. Uh, and uh, churches where absolutely everything will be put down to a possession. And there are other churches where actually you could quite happily believe that demons don't exist at all because they never get spoken about. And I have absolutely no idea uh, where Stag would fit into that, and I'm not asking you to uh, comment on that um, up front. Uh, but there is a sense in which we want to be alert to what the what devil is doing because the devil is real and the devil is active and he loves to get to our mind. But... I think one thing it is worth saying is certainly possessions in the Bible um, don't explain all mental illnesses and mental struggles. You see anxiety and depression and suicidal tendencies in characters where there's no hint of a possession. A second important thing to say is possessions only ever happened to non-Christians in the Bible. Uh, if the Holy Spirit is living inside you because you're a Christian, uh, the Holy Spirit does not share his house uh, with any unclean spirits, and therefore it's not possible uh, for a Christian that's struggling with their mental health uh, to have possession as a root of that. And it's also worth saying that demon possession is a desperately specialised area. Uh, and I think my quick answer is, whilst it's possible, it's certainly not the norm uh, that we are seeing in our world today. Uh, and if you are, have a particular personal question about that, I'd encourage you to go and chat to one of the, the leadership team here at church, and they can tease that through with you uh, very carefully, uh, because it's not something I can give a generic answer to. And I guess because we come from different cultures here as well, we might be coming from different backgrounds on that as well, so worth, worth thinking about on that. And please do, please do follow up if you want to. Um, slight, slight change um, of topic into to do with our bodies and body dysmorphia and how we view our bodies. Um, there's a question here that says, often the way in which preoccupation with one's appearance is considered vain or, un or worldly by Christians, oh, it's just disappeared, um, talking about body dysmorphia is almost anathema. How does selflessness fit into mental health? Oh, that's, there are so many ways we could go for that question. I love the brain of whoever wrote that question. That is just so deep and um, wise, and I can't even begin to answer it well. Um, I, I think there is a sense in which our culture does encourage us either to kind of um, camouflage ourselves because we're not good enough, or to um, uh, change ourselves because we're not good enough. Uh, when we've had painful experiences, we can want to cleanse ourselves or control ourselves. So there are lots of ways that either our painful experiences or our culture tell us that our body is not good enough, rather than the Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made bit, which is what uh, the Bible says about us. Uh, and I think there is a sense in which um, the Bible encourages us to celebrate who God has made us to be and to commit our bodies to use to his glory, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, to do it uh, to the glory of Christ. Uh, and so I think we don't want to forget our bodies completely uh, because we have been made embodied souls and therefore there is a rightness about celebrating what God has made. We are knitted together in the womb by God and it's right to be excited about how he's made us to be. It's certainly right to stand up against culture and the pressures of, of pain, not to use our bodies as kind of the, the forum in which we kind of act out our insecurities. Um, and I think, you ever read Tim Keller's little booklet, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness? There is something beautiful about not being self-focused, but by being Christ-focused. But so, like so many things, uh, let's be focused on Christ, but not unaware of or uncelebrating of who he has made us to be. Thanks, Helen. Um, we've got to thank you so much, whoever's written this question. It's, it's quite personal about a personal struggle. It says, I struggle with bulimia. Um, it feels uh, more action-based, and so I really struggle with guilt. How can we see what is sin and what is suffering in mental illness? I guess you were talking about that combination of different things. How do we discern that? Um, yeah, and if it's okay, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take that slightly away from that personal case study about which I know very, very little, and I'm likely to trample all over you if I try and make it uh, a, a personal response. Uh, and just say that we're always looking for that combination. 
And, and sometimes it can be quite useful just to list out the hard things that have happened that have led us to that point uh, of struggling with our mental health uh, and actually being realistic that we need to hear God's words of comfort in all of those situations and we need to hear them repeatedly. I think often as Christians we think that we need a bit of comfort once and then move on. But actually, if we look at the Psalms of Lament, they were meant to be sung on a regular basis. The people of God are meant to be lamenting regularly about the hard things of the past. Uh, and so actually, building a rhythm of regular lament, not, not feeling we need to be over the past, uh, but actually keep taking that pain to the Lord. But obviously, there are also uh, choices in there. Uh, and we can choose how to respond to the pain that, that has come at us. Now, those aren't easy choices. And sometimes the pain that's come at us is so, so overwhelming that we don't have the strength in and of ourselves to make those choices. Uh, that's where we need people like doctors and psychologists and biblical counsellors and friends at church and pastors to help us make good choices about food uh, and how to see food. Uh, and so I don't think we necessarily need to understand the exact proportion that is sin and suffering, but just to keep constantly r reminding ourselves that we need God's comfort because we are in a painful world, and we constantly need God's help and other people's help to make good choices in that world. And if we hold those things in tension, uh, then we'll probably be okay. Uh, but it is a, a long old road back from those kind of painful places, but there is hope. And thanks again. If, I, if that's you, I hope you can turn to some people who can help you as well. Please don't leave today without speaking to someone if you haven't already um, shared. That would be great to be supporting you. Um, Helen, I think we've probably asked one more question. Um, there are so many, so many questions here. Please do follow up with Helen in a minute. Um, there's a question, the next question down about antidepressants and reliance on Jesus. If I'm taking antidepressants, how do I know if I'm relying on um, on those rather than trusting in Christ? Is it possible to do both, to rely on Christ wholly and to take antidepressants? Yes. Great. Do you want a slightly longer <laughs> answer? Um, uh, antidepressants are about uh, relief of suffering. Um, uh, and if they get us to a point where we're more able to read God's word, where we're more able to remember what is true, where we're more able to engage with the community around us, and where we're more able to get up and live life for Jesus, then praise God for antidepressants. They are a wonderful thing. They're not the answer to everything, but they are a wonderful part and parcel. And you can trust God uh, whilst you're on those antidepressants, and you can certainly uh, trust God in the future, whether that future is remaining on them or whether that future is coming off of them. Uh, where we put our eyes can be helped by our antidepressants, but it's not defined by them. Thanks so much, Helen. That's a great note to end on. Helen, we're really thankful for you joining us today. Thank you so much. And I know you've said you're very happy to stick around. Um, maybe if you're happy to be around here somewhere, people can come and talk to you if they want to. Let's keep talking. But why don't I close us in prayer for the moment? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Um, we thank you so much for who you are, that you are our Heavenly Father. You know every hair on our head. You know every page of our lives. It's written in your book. Thank you so much. There's nowhere we can go um, to escape from you, that you're with us always. Thank you for those reminders of what you're like. And thank you so much for real hope in the face of real struggle. Thank you so much that as Christians, we, we can face up to the reality of a broken world. We, we can, um, yeah, it doesn't surprise us. It doesn't surprise you. Father, pray that we'd be good at helping each other to be real, um, that we'd be able to be honest with each other, honest with you. And and pray, Father, that we'd be able to point each other to the comfort that is found um, in knowing you, that you're with us, that you, you love us because of Jesus, and you're preparing for us a, a perfect future that we've been reminded of this morning, a certain future, um, where death will be no more, where there'll be no crying or pain or suffering. And we praise you for that, Father. Help us to keep one another looking forward until that day. Amen. Amen. Oh, Great to see you all. No, no rush to, to dash off. Do stick around if you need to, but equally if you need to head, um, do so. We'll see you on Tuesday.